Growing up during the golden era of the JRPG genre, I often find myself yearning for times long since past. As the memories of my childhood and teen years begin to fade into a more sepia tone, there are certain moments that remain fully coloured, as if they only happened yesterday, standing in staunch denial of the decades between then and now. Beating a particular boss, meeting a character for the first time, travelling with comrades and losing those closest in tales of valour and escapism like no others. But while it seems like there are a hundred examples, perhaps the most poignant of these belong to a single series for me, or maybe a single era, in the history of a particular developer. Final Fantasy and Squaresoft are in no small part responsible not only for my love of this medium, but also for many of my preferences for storytelling within it. While I'd been playing games for nearly a decade before I happened upon the series, I was lucky enough to be just the right age when what would be the gateway JRPG for many Western players dropped in 1997. You might have heard of it. But like so many others, Final Fantasy VII would just be the start of my journey, and what lay ahead would be my first playthroughs of some of the greatest video games ever made in my opinion. Between 1994 and 2001, Squaresoft released Final Fantasy VI, VII, VIII, IX and X, Final Fantasy Tactics, Vagrant Story, Xenogears, Chrono Trigger, Super Mario RPG, Seiken Densetsu III, to name just a few, and as if that wasn't enough, there was still Final Fantasy 1-5 to to go back and play from only a few years prior. Now don't get me wrong, there are many other amazing JRPGs of this era, and indeed other eras, that were just as special. But for me, this was the golden era, both for the genre, and arguably for video games in general. As time passed and I got older, my love for these games, and games in general, refused to wane, in the end giving rise to my old career in games development, and now a new career, making and streaming games content here on YouTube and over on Twitch. But despite all the games I've worked on, and the many more I've played since those simpler days, whenever I return to those titles, between the ever-growing back catalogue of more modern games, I seem to love them even more, or see something in them that I missed. But perhaps more than this, age has brought with it a more analytical approach, allowing me to take deeper dives and fully comprehend both the game in question's themes, their production histories, and the motivations of their creators. One such creator, who ranks as one of my personal favourites in the industry, is Final Fantasy creator Hironobu Sakaguchi. Born in 1962, Sakaguchi would attend university in Yokohama to study electrical engineering. Whilst there, he would take a part-time job at a Japanese startup named Square, which had been created as a branch of the Deniyusha Electric Company in order to install and maintain power lines and other electrical infrastructure across Tokyo and the surrounding areas. In 1986, Square would break from Deniyusha and become its own independent company, shifting its focus to software development. It was at this time that Sakaguchi, having already dropped out of university in 1983, became a full-time employee and took the role of Director of Planning and Development. What followed would be the development and release of several games for the Nintendo Entertainment System, all of which failed to garner commercial or critical success. With Square hemorrhaging money and Sakaguchi himself beginning to wonder if he would ever find success in games development, it would be at this point that his most career-defining moment would occur, and it would also be a moment that in many ways still defines Square as a company to this day. Originally titled Fighting Fantasy, Sakaguchi's idea was to create a turn-based role-playing game with a heavy story focus and deep, intricate systems. Such an idea was entirely different from anything Square had produced up to this point, but barring a small change in title over copyright concerns, the game was greenlit. Final Fantasy would release in Japan on December 18th, 1987, to huge critical and commercial success, spawning a colossal franchise which would go on to sell millions across the world, and remains a tentpole for Square to this day. But what of Sakaguchi? Well, while he would remain the head of the franchise for many years, and arguably continue to be responsible for what many, myself included, deem the series' golden era, his time at Square would eventually come to an end. By the late 1990s, Sakaguchi had been promoted to Executive Vice President at Squaresoft. However, it was at this time that changes in the company's upper management began to unsettle things. Still acting as the head of the franchise, Sakaguchi had worked exclusively on every major mainline Final Fantasy entry, barring Final Fantasy VIII, 
which was reportedly left mainly in the hands of Yoshinori Kitase and his team. Kitase, who had been a member of the core Final Fantasy team for many years, had reportedly taken on an understudy or protege position in previous games, despite being credited as a director on Final Fantasy VI, VII and Chrono Trigger. Kotase's team would also include Tetsuya Nomura as character designer, monster designer, and battle visual director for Final Fantasy VIII, who himself would go on to work on many more Final Fantasy games, as well as many other popular entries in Square's gameography, including the Kingdom Hearts series and The World Ends With You, among others. But while Final Fantasy VIII would garner massive success critically and commercially, Sakaguchi was reportedly not happy with many of the creative directions it took, and so would once again take the creative reins with the series' ninth entry, a game which he reportedly still believes to be the best in the series. While Final Fantasy IX was originally planned as a Gaiden or spin-off title, the irony is that it would probably become the purest embodiment of Sakaguchi's vision for the franchise. On top of all of this, pressure was beginning to mount from the new upper management to try and capitalise more on the success of previous entries in the series by creating sequels and spin-offs, an idea that Sakaguchi had always stood fervently against. <laughs> あの、ストーリーっていうのはある意味世界観とかをね、縛っちゃう可能性があるんで、逆にそこを変えることでそういう出し切り型のタイトルにしたいっていう、まあ、なんていうんでしょう、こうチャレンジしようよっていう一つの
when the likes of Sakaguchi and Co were either creating for my money the series' best entries, or were producing other classic examples of the genre. While many of these games were not perfect, it was, in my opinion, a perfect age for JRPGs nonetheless, and much of this can be attributed to Square's output at the time. And so, when I found out that Sakaguchi was making a new turn-based JRPG, inspired by the likes of Final Fantasy VI, which would feature many staples from the good old days, to say I was intrigued would be an understatement. However, this was not because I necessarily thought what we would get would be a new golden era Final Fantasy game in everything but name, but was instead because a game like this had the potential to represent more than an entry in a series to me. It had the potential to revisit a defining era in my life, from days now long past. So what is Fantasian? First announced on March 25th, 2019 at Apple Arcade's live event, Fantasian was billed as a turn-based JRPG with a heavy story and character focus and will be released as an Apple Arcade exclusive in two lengthy installments. Its first part was released on April 2nd, 2021, with a second part to follow sometime at the end of the year. Developed by Mistwalker, Sakaguchi would act as producer and story writer on the project, as well as overseeing many of its other elements. And Takuto Nakamura, a lead programmer on many of Mistwalker's other projects, would serve as the game's director. Joining them would be another Squaresoft veteran, in the form of Nobuo Uematsu, who would act as chief composer on the project. Not since Mistwalker's last console release back in 2011, the excellent Wii exclusive The Last Story, had Sakaguchi and Uematsu worked together. However, perhaps more poignantly than this, is the history that these two men share once again with the Final Fantasy series, with Uematsu having composed the music for many entries, and even in my opinion, having also elevated the standards expected from video game OSTs in general. In fact, Uematsu's work, especially that heard in the Final Fantasy series, has become famous the world over and is performed by many noted orchestras in some of the most grandiose venues to this day. But with both Uematsu and Sakaguchi citing thoughts of retirement after this project, how does Fantasian compare to the classics, and would it be a worthy swan song for two people who have given us so much over the last three plus decades? Well, while it's definitely not perfect, what Mistwalker have delivered here is a game that comes together to form something way better than the sum of its individual parts. The story concerns a young man named Leo, who, after suffering an injury in the game's opening, develops amnesia and must go on a quest to discover his past, gaining many allies and meeting many nefarious enemies along the way. So, right from the off, I think I know what you're thinking. That's a pretty generic premise for a JRPG, and you'd be absolutely right. In fact, it might be the most used premise in JRPG history at this point. Moreover, as the game progresses, many other staples of the genre begin to occur, such as themes of self-discovery and coming of age the notion of rediscovering family and a sense of belonging, a group of initially ill-fated young friends utilising the power of friendship to overcome an evil that threatens the entire world, the back-heavy exposition of the villain's plot detailed in too much text towards the end of the game. It's all here. However, what becomes clear very quickly is that much of this seems to have been an intentional choice in order to elicit a certain feeling of familiarity from the player. Sakaguchi has said many times in interviews and in tweets that he replayed some of the old Final Fantasy titles whilst making Fantasian, and has cited Final Fantasy VI in particular as an important source of inspiration. And while I would say that Final Fantasy VI actually does a much better job of avoiding some of the more obvious staples of the genre, the intention here is clear as day. Mistwalker set out to make a JRPG that could have been released in the mid to late 90s, and they executed on that concept almost flawlessly, even if it doesn't quite reach the dizzying heights of some of the best examples of that era. However, despite this, it left me feeling like I'd experienced something special that was made, at least in part, for many out there who yearn for the return to those older, simpler days. However, there is one area where I think the story is objectively flawed, and that's with the game's pacing. In the lead up to launch, while there wasn't much marketing in general to be honest, as myself and many other fans rushed to get hold of an Apple device once the game's stealth dropped as part of Apple Arcade's latest update, one thing that is not conveyed, in either the thumbnail images, the title menu, or anywhere obvious, is the fact that this is only part one of a two-part tale. So obfuscated was this information, that I've had to tell several friends who are part way through the game that this is the case, as they had absolutely no idea. And in a weird way, it also kind of feels like the game has no idea too. Characters get introduced and added to your party right at the end of part one. There is no proper free roam after the credits, but you can still keep playing in a very limited area with little to do. You unlock a new ability system for the main character right near the end, with barely any time to use it, and there is no definitive build to part one's ending. The game just kind of stops, 
What's even weirder is that there's a perfect place to end part one a few hours earlier, which has an appropriate build-up and revelation to create a compelling cliffhanger. I won't give any details here for fear of spoiling it, but if you've already beaten the game yourself, you probably know which part I'm talking about. It sort of feels like the idea to make it a two-part experience was made late in production to avoid missing its release date, but that's pure conjecture. Either way, there's no two ways about it. Right now, it feels like half a game. Still, having said all of this, it's still a relatively substantial experience, as it is. While it might not be narratively satisfying without its second half, Fantasian Part 1 still clocks in at 20 to 30 hours, and for many, this will be enough to satiate their hunger for more until the end of the year. I beat every optional side quest, took my time with the story, and grinded enough to kill every optional boss that I could find, but I didn't go all the way to level cap, and my clock was just under the 30 hour mark when the credits rolled. Finally regarding this, it's worth reiterating that the aforementioned endgame activities are pretty limited here, and there doesn't seem to be any new game plus, so once you're done with the story, there's not much to do but wait until episode 2 unfortunately. In terms of the aforementioned side quests, there aren't that many, and barring one that asked me to travel around several areas and piece together someone's whereabouts, most were fetch quests or required little effort to complete. While some had some decent writing that fleshed out the world, none were lengthy or epic or contained optional super bosses or anything like that, with only some mildly useful rewards being available instead after completing them. Still, while all of this might sound a little negative, these are actually relatively minor gripes in the grand scheme of things, and there is plenty to love about Fantasian and its story. Its characters are distinct and likeable, its world and lore are interesting, and its battle system is one of the best I've seen in a while. Battles play out as a turn-based affair, with the turn order for both the player-controlled characters and the enemies being shown in the bottom right corner of the screen. Each enemy is assigned a letter, and so it can be seen where in the turn queue they fall, allowing the player to target the next enemy in the queue first if desired. When attacking an enemy, the player has several options open to them. Some abilities and characters are able to pierce through rows of enemies, bend around those who are in front of their intended target, or even a combination of both. Actions in battle come in the form of standard attacks, abilities and spells that often have elemental properties like fire, lightning, etc., buffs that can protect against damage or boost stats, debuffs that can lower the enemy's stats or inflict status ailments, and the use of items for healing and causing damage. Moreover, each character adds a different spin to these systems, such as Kina favouring white magic or Ez utilising combined items for a variety of actions, Albed style. There is even a character named Tam who, unfortunately the player only gets to use a handful of times, at least in part 1, whose chief mechanic is spending some of his own HP to inflict damage and status ailments on the enemy. These systems really come into their own in the game's many boss battles, which are all diverse and contain interesting little twists on the game's mechanics. This means that different strategies will need to be employed by the player, and working out how to approach certain bosses once again took me back to that golden era of JRPG's past. While what's provided here is not the hardest or most complicated challenge, allowing for most veterans to probably beat the game with little to no issue, Fantasian does push back just enough to stay interesting and feel balanced. On top of all of this is probably Fantasian's most innovative system when it comes to battling, the Dimension. Much like JRPGs of old, Fantasian utilises random battles. For the uninitiated, what this essentially means is that when you're running around a hostile area, you will occasionally get attacked and pulled into a battle on a separate screen. However, a short ways into the game, the player attains an item named the Dimension. What this item does is essentially store random battles away for you to be able to fight later in one large fight, comprising all the enemies you have stored at once. Now, there are some caveats. It only stores 30 enemies initially, which can be upgraded to 40 through an optional side quest, and if you've never fought the enemy that attacks you before, then you're forced into battle with it once before it can be stored next time. Also, if the device fills up to its maximum limit, the enemies will break out and you'll be forced to fight them immediately. The upshoot of all of this is a system that allows the player to grind in one large chunk, and also explore any areas they like relatively freely, with the added risk-reward element of saving up too many monsters to fight at once if you're not careful. Moreover, the player can also turn the Dimension off if they like, and simply fight random battles as they come up, allowing for an experience that is much closer to those found in the games from which Fantasian so clearly takes its inspirations. On top of this, the player characters will also have their health and MP restored every time they level up, and will also gain EXP even if they're killed in battle, automatically being revived with 1 HP afterwards, eliminating the need to use items or spells to bring them back to life. Finally, there's also the growth map system, which, as mentioned earlier, is introduced right near the end of part 1. While I won't give away why this is as it's related to the story, and this is a spoiler-free review in that regard, the essential idea here is that after levelling up, Leo will earn SP, which he can spend to unlock various stat increases, new abilities, and special attacks. 
While there isn't a lot of opportunity to dig into this system due to its late game introduction, it appears that here is where the really powerful abilities reside, and I look forward to really beefing up my party with this system in part 2. As it stands now though, it's more of a tease for what's to come than an intrinsic part of the experience. However, while the battle system is definitely a big part of the appeal here, it has to be said that Fantasian's best assets lay within its environments and art direction. While I'm not the biggest fan of the character designs, and the UI and menus are perfectly fine, every single environment in this game is, for want of a better word, incredible. In several interviews over the years, Sakaguchi has mentioned how he saw the fixed camera environments from the old Final Fantasy games as dioramas. Such a concept is one that acts as the underpinning for Fantasia's whole look and art style, with the game even being described on the Apple Arcade Store as, quote, a diorama RPG. In fact, in order to make the game, Sakaguchi, an avid miniaturist and diorama enthusiast himself, and his team, built every location as full dioramas. Then, once completed, they took high-definition images of the angles they wanted for when the player is running around, touched them up and blended them with full motion camera movement, and added full 3D character work and environmental elements, like water or lighting effects over the top. The results are simply awe-inspiring, and culminate in one of the best-looking mobile games I've ever seen. The areas you traverse are all interesting, diverse, and so atmospheric, from desert towns to enchanted forests to bustling capitals, every location oozes atmosphere and character. While I will say that the motion between images can be a little jarring, create some strange looking artifacts when playing on a bigger screen, and also be a little frustrating when moving as it can occasionally redirect you, all in all, I still love the look of the game. I just maybe would have preferred it without the blended moving shots between angles. Also, while pretty much all of these environments look amazing, some of the design elements that are involved in progressing through them can sometimes feel a little antiquated and even frustrating. For example, there is one area where the player is tasked with opening a bunch of chests, all of which contain mandatory fights with the same five enemies in different combinations and quantities. Another section towards the end of the game dispenses a ton of lore and exposition through just looking at several monitors and reading text. While text on animated backgrounds is utilised elsewhere in the game to great effect, often evoking the excellent written memories sections from Mistwalker's other classic JRPG, Lost Odyssey, at this point in the game, it just felt a bit of a rushed and lazy way of getting the player up to speed on everything they needed to know before the first part ended. Still, these are the exceptions, and for the most part, areas were fun to traverse, even if they could be a little on the basic side. But there is one more element of the presentation we have failed to talk about yet, and that's Uematsu's score. While undoubtedly not his best work, the score here is nothing short of fantastic, with many tracks channeling his work from decades past. While I can't pretend that anything here has the gravitas of the Final Fantasy VII OST, or the sheer majesty of the immortal Liberi Fatali from Final Fantasy VIII, there are still many standouts that all serve to create wonderful atmosphere and tone throughout the game's many diverse locations. If this does end up being Uematsu's final score, then there are worse highs to go out on. So, before we wrap up, I want to take a moment to address the fact that this is a mobile game, and what that might mean for its audience. First of all, I should say that I'm relatively inexperienced with playing mobile games in general, preferring console or PC experiences personally. Now, this is not me saying mobile games are bad, just that I don't play them too much. However, this actually ended up being a good thing, because Fantasian does not feel in any way like a mobile game, at least to me. Being part of Apple Arcade helps this immensely. For those who don't know, Apple Arcade is kind of like Netflix or Game Pass for Apple devices, where you pay around $5 a month and can download and play a library of games, all of which are free of microtransactions and gacha mechanics. It seems clear to me that Apple is putting quite a lot of money into this at the moment, with high production value seen from many of the games in its lineup, and for those who are hoping that Fantasian would come to other formats, I'm not sure this will be happening anytime soon. Time will tell, I guess. Either way, I guess what I'm trying to say here is please don't give this game a miss just because it's a mobile title, even if you're not someone who plays mobile games generally. I played it on an Apple TV 4K with a DualShock 4, and it honestly felt like any other console game. But I don't think the problem here is one of quality, but instead one of exposure 
Many hardcore JRPG fans either have no idea this game exists, which is probably also due to the aforementioned lack of marketing, or generally don't seek out these types of games on Apple devices. For Mistwalker's sake, I hope that it does well, and while many have bemoaned their choice of platform over the years, with Lost Odyssey coming exclusively to Xbox 360 and The Last Story remaining a Wii exclusive before this, I personally have little problem with it. Making a game is hard and expensive, and if you're an independent studio like Mistwalker, I'm sure having enough financial backing to not have to compromise your vision is of paramount importance. I'm glad this game was made, Apple Arcade or not. I just really hope it reaches people out there who will really appreciate it. Nostalgia is a broader term than many give it credit for nowadays. So often it's utilised or interpreted in the most obvious fashion, with the worst kind of fan service simply having plot elements or sequels occur, only to wink at the audience and almost audibly say, remember this? But that's not always what nostalgia has to be. While there's a place for more direct referencing, sometimes it can just be a feeling, an essence of something you lost, or miss, or love. Usually fleeting, but nonetheless concrete in its appearance that returns you almost without warning back to a familiar and comfortable time. Fantasian, for all its strengths and weaknesses, is the embodiment of this kind of nostalgia. While many have said that it feels to them like a Final Fantasy title in all but name from Square's Golden Era, I instead think it feels like something else. This is not the perfectly executed vision of what Sakaguchi always envisaged Final Fantasy to be. That game already exists, and it's called Final Fantasy IX. This is instead something different yet familiar. While it's hard to describe, it feels to me like masters of their craft, long removed from what made them famous, rediscovering just a hint of the magic that we all once shared. And that hint is enough to make the game much more than the sum of its parts. While it's not perfect, and definitely has a few issues, I nevertheless came away from Fantasian elated and eager for more. It's a game that's allowed me to return to a format, style and tone that I've missed dearly for decades, and for that alone, it's worth experiencing. Hey all, I hope you enjoyed the review. If you like what I'm doing over here at First Outpost, then please consider subscribing, ringing that stupid bell so you know when new content drops, and sharing on your social media of choice. Also, feel free to give the video a like or dislike and drop a comment, it all helps. Finally, if you fancy some more intense First Outpost JRPG action, then catch me over on Twitch on Mondays, where I'm currently doing my first playthrough ever of Persona 5 Royal. The link will be in the description below. Thanks again for watching, and stay safe out there.